Order. It's time for questions to the Minister of Health, Social Services and Public Safety. And we will start with the listed questions. Before I call Mr Basil McRae, I have to inform the Assembly that the question four has been withdrawn. Mr McRae. Question number one, please, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Minister, Principal Deputy Speaker, local gum medicine clinics are an effective means of providing for the diagnosis and care of patients with sexually transmitted infections and related problems, including contraceptive care, uh, genital conditions, and HIV. Confidentiality is a fundamental component of working in the clinic, and staff are trained to deal with all sexual health problems and, prov and provide advice and education and information to their patients, friends and family, and outside agencies. The main conditions treated in this specialty are bacterial STIs, syphilis, gonorrhea, and chlamydia, and viral STIs, a human papilloma virus, herpes, and musculum. Gum clinics may also provide additional services such as erectile dysfunctional management and importantly act as centres for training and governance for sexual, sexual health networks. Mr McRae for supplementary. Um, Minister, um, in England, the Public Health Outcomes Framework provides useful indicators uh, which local areas can be benchmarked against. Uh, one indicator is especially relevant to adult sexual health, and that is the proportion of people presenting with HIV at a late stage of infection. Uh, what is the Minister's view of the framework, and is it relevant to Northern Ireland? And if so, would he accept that the number of consultants in our gum clinics ought to rise from 4 to 20 to meet the demand? Um, as the member will be aware, the RQA undertook a review of the provision of specialist sexual health services, and that uh, report was published in, 2000 and, in October 2013. And I think one of the, the, the reasons he's raising this is that, that there is a vacancy, a staff vacancy, within the present provision. That's a grade six nurse. Well, what I can tell him is that that post has been advertised and trawled, and I think we'll be in a position fairly soon to uh, indicate that there has been that appointment, which we believe will bring us up to the full complement of staff required. He, he raised the issue of HIV. Uh, in in uh, total, we've had uh, 522 people have been receiving HIV care uh, in Northern Ireland uh, in 2011. That's the latest figure. Uh, and in two, also in that year, with 82 new diagnoses um, were made of HIV. I think that's very unfortunate because HIV has been with us now for almost 30 years. And there has been a very intense public education program to alert people of the dangers of certain practices which run the risk of contracting HIV. And sadly, even though that extensive campaign has been, abroad, has been well managed by the PHA and has uh, targeted the entire population, we still are seeing an inexorable rise in the number of HIV diagnoses. And I think that's very, very unfortunate because there are very simple and effective ways of avoiding contracting that condition. Ms. Paula Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and as the chair of the All-Party Group on Section Health, um, I welcome the Minister's response, albeit I want to impress upon him um, the pressures that our gum clinic is, is facing up in the Royal. And as the Minister would be aware, we have a reduction in cervical cancer um, due to good vaccination programme in our girls albeit we still haven't uh, provided that for our boys. We also have a reduction in teenage pregnancies. Can I ask the Minister what he is doing to further reduce this number? This is actually quite a good news story. Um, in 2012, there were 1,100 recorded births to teenage mothers in Northern Ireland. That's 6% lower than 2011, when there was 1,170. And, and even more fundamentally, at 27% lower than a decade ago when it stood at 1,502 births. Uh, however, I must emphasize that the birth rate for teenage mothers aged 13 to 16 remains two to three times higher in the most deprived parts of Northern Ireland. This is still an issue, but at least it's an issue that we are tackling with, with considerable success. And we know the outcomes for children born from teenage mothers often are much poorer than those of mothers who wait to a more mature age before giving birth. Uh, the HPV vaccine has been a success. Of course, the incident is, is, is much lower. Uh, it's much more an issue for young girls than it is for young boys, but we're keeping that issue under review. But at least on both counts, in HPV and in terms of uh, protect, uh, teenage pregnancies, um, we are having considerable success. Regarding HP vaccinations, we're going to be guided on, on, this, on the evidence, but I need to say once again, extending uh, that to a wider population 
will require more funding. And one of the fundamental issues that I face is the fact that I have no finances at all for new service development in 2015-16. And that's an area of profound concern to me because there are so many worthy initiatives that could be rolled out to protect public health, and at the moment we don't see where we're going to get the money to pay for them. Call Mr. Colum Eastwood. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, can I thank the Minister for his answer thus far? Uh, the Minister alluded to some of the figures around HIV cases. Um, I think it's the fact that uh, since 2000, uh, between the North and GB, we've had the largest increase in new HIV cases. Um, does the Minister know why that is, or what we're doing, or what we're not doing to try and turn that around? Uh, I presume he means Northern Ireland when he refers to the North rather than Malin Head. Um, the, the review team in 2013 found that Northern Ireland uh, doesn't as yet have a, a specific set of agreed standards for sexual health services, and there's a need for standardisation of practice across all of those services. I I'd also need, it, it indicated that we needed to do more in terms of commissioning, leadership, training, workforce planning, and the capacity of services. I, it's no doubt it's very worrying that Northern Ireland in particular it has a, a greater increase, but of course we did start from a much lower base. And of course, as Northern Ireland has become a much more cosmopolitan society, uh, we have found that that has led to an increase in sexually transmitted infections. Um, I find it quite worrying because not, not only is HIV increasing, for instance, uh, the number of sexually transmitted infections uh, uh, diagnosed at cheap gum clinics has increased by 28 per cent between 2000 and 2011. And in 2011, there were 7,661 new diagnoses. Uh, were, were made at our, those clinics. So that's a very, very worrying statistic. And we really need to get the me message home to our population and to those who have come into our community that there are important steps that can be taken to avoid contracting sexually transmitted infections. And it's very much depends upon the community listening to that message and taking advice that will prevent what is to me quite a worrying uh, change in the situation. Call Mr. Cathal Boylan. Kesh Deverdaw. Uh, Let a hold. Question number two, please. Um, I, while I have no plans to develop a regional st strategy specifically for Huntington's disease, following the publication of the United Kingdom Strategy for Rare Diseases in November 2014, my department is currently developing the Northern Ireland Rare Diseases Implementation Plan. This will set out how commitments identified in the strategy will be taken forward in Northern Ireland and it's anticipated that the final plan will be published in the summer of this year. Mr. Boylan for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and could I thank the Minister for his answer. But could the Minister just outline what services are available at present? Uh, people diagnosed with Huntington's disease have access to the full range of core community health and social services. Uh, across Northern Ireland, including physiotherapy, occupational therapy, community nursing, speech and language therapy, dietetics, social work, social care, domiciliary care, uh, and uh, uh, daycare. Uh, the Huntington's Disease Regional Service is provided by the Belfast Health and Social Care Trust, uh, and I fully support uh, the need to develop research, particularly in the rare disease sector, so that patients can receive the appropriate treatment at the earliest opportunity. There are 120 patients in Northern Ireland currently being treated for Huntington's disease in Northern Ireland. Uh, that it means it constitutes a rare disease. Now, it's a very serious genetic condition and life-limiting. That doesn't indicate how, that we don't take it seriously. But it does make it difficult for that relatively small number of patients to develop uh, large-scale projects for it. I would say that based on clinical need, there's always the option of uh, travelling across to the mainland of the United Kingdom for specialist care, but that case would have to be put up by the clinician uh, and, and funded accordingly. Call Mr. George Robinson. Thank you, Mr. Principal Dep Deputy Speaker. <clears throat> Can I ask the Minister for an update on the rare disease strategy? Um, publication on the consultation of the draft Northern Ireland Implementation Plan ended on the 19th of January 2015 and following the analysis of the responses and amendments to the plan it's envisaged that we will definitely have it by the summer of this year. I have paid particular interest in the, the, the rare disease partnership. I have attended all the various events associated with the implementation plan. I, I do from a, a, a personal interest because I, I have a rare disease uh, and so does my daughter so therefore I, I am always very interested to see what happens 
um, with these conditions and what treatments are, are available and the care pathways. So I'm paying particular interest into this subject, in the subject and I look forward to the publication of the full plan, uh, hopefully by, by the end of August 2015. Mr. Donny very much, um, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, when it comes to the Huntington Disease Association, will the Minister actually meet with them and with the Health and Social Care Board to see how the, this can be uh, dealt with better? I would be delighted to meet. Uh, I have met, there's 169 registered health charities in all there, and I think each of them have been through my door at least five times. Uh, but I must say I have not had direct contact with the Huntington Disease uh, Association or charity. And therefore, if he would wish to coordinate a meeting, I would be absolutely delighted because it's a, it's, it's a condition that until this question was asked, I frankly didn't know an awful lot about it. I was obviously aware of it. I wasn't aware of the scale. And I'm always very interested in the charitable sector who, who provides so much useful information to me and to the department generally. And I find it extremely beneficial to meet these charities and certainly the doors open to the hunting disease folk. Call Mr. Kieran McCarthy. Mr. Deputy Speaker, could the Minister advise the Assembly if he has had any correspondence with the hunting disease, disease people across the water or indeed down south? Um, no, no, I haven't. Uh, and funny, when I was looking at the material in connection with this condition, it did surprise me that, I ha as far as we can trace, uh, apart from Mr. Boyland, who, who takes a personal interest in this subject, I have not come across uh, much degree of uh, material on hunting disease. And, um, it's one of those conditions, because it's a relatively small number of sufferers in Northern Ireland, it hasn't crossed me in terms of constituency uh, casework either. So therefore, I, I think no doubt this will open up the, the doors to an avalanche of material coming through from, from, from the, uh, the, the charity, and I'd welcome that, because I think it, it's still life-limiting. Its average onset is 30 to 45 years of age, and the life expectancy following that is 12 to 12, 15 to 20 years. So it is certainly life-limiting and a very painful and difficult condition, and I would like to know more about it, and I'm sure that I've prompted both himself and Mr. Kenahan to ensure that, that ignorance is swept away very quickly. Mr. Mr. Lawrence Kelly. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Question three, Minister. The final budget for 15-16 is exceptionally challenging for my department. Work is ongoing with all the trusts, the HSCB, the PHA and other arm's length bodies to clarify the implications of the executive's final budget and develop detailed saving proposals for 2015. As part of the process, the board is currently financing the, finalising the budget allocations for each of the trusts. However, at this stage, I can give an indication that we're planning to allocate an extra £28 million to the Southern Trust for 1516. That represents a 22 per cent, uh, about 22 per cent of the total planned increase to all the trusts. Now, the, the Southern Trust spends about 16 per cent of the total budget at the moment. So, uh, uh, an increase of 22 per cent represents a real and significant increase. Uh, whilst there is an increase in planned allocations, all the trusts must deliver substantial savings in order to live within their budget and meet rising demand. And indeed, I have those proposals from the Southern Trust. As she knows, the Southern Trust has a very strong management team and they've been very quick to come back with their proposals. Uh, and I think most of them are, are, are sensible and, and deliverable. Savings from non-frontline areas will be maximised. However, given the scale and challenge that health and social care is facing in 1516, savings will also need to be delivered from frontline services, which inevitably will have an impact on those who are, those who are trying to meet their needs. In any case, I can assure her that we will be maintaining the safety of services for patients and clients across the trust, and that will remain my priority. Well, Mrs. Kelly, for a supplement. <clears throat> Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. And I welcome uh, the increase in funding. Could the Minister provide uh, any more detail in relation to how that might be split in terms of acute service provision and community service provision? No, we're, we're, we're not just that far on. We, we, we've, we've left it, we leave it to the trust board and the new chief executive, Paula Clark, and her team. Uh, to work that out. Uh, whilst we've got a rough indication of where we're going budget-wise next year, we haven't yet sort of nailed down exactly what money is going where. Though can I say from my experience of the Southern Trust, the extra £22 million will be very well spent. I, said we, I was at a function on Thursday where we said goodbye to the outgoing uh, Chief Executive of the Southern Trust, Maureen McElindon, and there was quite a few members from the House were present. And I must say I think we have a very, very strong team 
even with the loss of Maria, we have a very strong team in the Southern Trust, and I think that £22 million will be very well spent. Uh, I've noticed that in my seven years in health, the Southern Trust in almost every indicator has been at the top of the league as far as Northern Ireland is concerned. Uh, and therefore, that's why I think we need to give co uh, support and confirmation to that success by investing further in what is a first-rate service. Mr. Sidney Anderson. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his responses thus far. Minister, can I ask what changes there has been in relation to the numbers of key staff in the Southern Trust area over this last four years? Well, uh, uh, we've, we've obviously maintained our priority that we must invest in frontline services. So it's worth saying that, for instance, in, since Mr. Putz was appointed as Minister, there's been an 11% a decrease in administration staff. We have decreased sports support services by 23%, but on medical and dental staff, we've increased by 19%, and qualified nurses have been increased by 9%, and the professional staff and technical group have been increased by 14%. And I hope later on to refer to the huge increase in frontline staff that have been delivered by uh, my, my predecessor, and I will continue to do so to bring extra staff in. For instance, almost 900 new nurses have been taken on since uh, my party took on this portfolio uh, four years ago. And I think it gives a clear indication that, that we are putting more feet on the wards and moving more resources into frontline care, particularly in areas such as Craigavon and Dizzy Hill, where we know it will be well used. And indeed, both hospitals have maintained their position as being in the top 40 hospitals in the United Kingdom. Uh, for year after year, and if you saw what the competition was like, I think that's a remarkable achievement by the Southern Area team. Ms. Joanne Dobson. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I thank the Minister also for his answers? And I met with management of the Southern Trust at the hospital recently and appreciate the very real pressures which staff are under. Can the Minister give his assessment of the potential repercussions of having more pressure on an already stretched workforce? And I share the very real concern which was reiterated to me about the nursing, sh nursing staff shortage. How does he plan to resolve that at Craigavon Hospital? I think the fact that we've managed to recruit 892 <laughs> nurses in four years would indicate that we, we accept the argument she's making. Uh, yes, yes, I accept what you're saying. We are still short of nurses and we are still short of GPs in Northern Ireland and we're still short of middle grade doctors and consultants. And we have a fundamental problem. 20% of our nurses who qualify in Northern Ireland go elsewhere. They either go to Australia or to England or London or wherever where they're recruited. And that is a real issue. Uh, also, we, we, we lose 250 middle grade doctors at the minute qualified in Northern Ireland who have gone straight to Australia. So we are doing everything we can to recruit. But there's a, there's a point I think I need to make. I attended the dinner on Saturday night of a very successful private residential home in Castle Derg. And the problem is, if we extend our recruitment into the trust of nurses, the inevitably where they're coming from is from that sector. And that is making life extremely difficult for those who are trying to manage private nursing homes and private residential homes. We're robbing Peter to pay Paul. And what we need to do under the Workforce Review is to find a way where we can train more nurses uh, to, 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 to supply the need that she's identified. But I can also say the Southern Trust have been much more successful than other trusts in attracting and retaining staff. And therefore, for instance, their bank agency uh, uh, budget is much smaller than the other four trusts. Call Mr. David McNary. In light of what the minister has just said, would he really consider earnestly putting a cap on nurses who have been trained in Northern Ireland for a period of time to stay here so that we're not losing them to the places he said we are losing them? Very, very, very interesting point. It costs us £860,000 to train a doctor in Northern Ireland, and there's nothing to stop that person, as soon as they're registered, getting on the plane and going to Bondi Beach. And should we be spending our taxpayers' money in Northern Ireland to train doctors for the rest of the world? Now, it doesn't cost as much as that to train a nurse, but we, should we be training nurses to go to Barking or Somerset or, or to Tottenham or wherever in England? And unfortunately, we couldn't do it whilst we remain within the European Union. We couldn't stop them going elsewhere within the European Union. There's a free movement of staff. But we will have to seriously look at some way, not of perhaps of preventing staff from going, but saying if you go, you will pay back a significant proportion of the money that costs to train you. And that has already implemented in other professions. Now, I, this is only at a very initial stage, but I think we do need to look at that because 
I don't see why I'm training nurses and training doctors to go to Sydney. I just don't see why. But there is another argument to that. For years, we benefit enormously from doctors and nurses coming from places like India, Pakistan, and the Philippines. And until the, even in the ward that I have experienced off recently, a good proportion of the nurses, first rate nurses, are from the Philippines. So we do gain the other way. So it is a double edged sword. But I do think he has a point. It's very worrying. We're losing so many of our top staff. The good news, of course, it does mean the rest of the world regards our staff as extremely competent and well trained. And therefore, they're the envy of the rest of the world. But we'd like to keep them. Yeah. Call Mr. Gregory Campbell. Number five. The Northern Trust model for services in the Causeway Glens is based around an acute hospital in Korean, with an emergency department and supporting clinical services, a well-developed intermediate uh, care service and community teams evenly distributed across the area. In January, the Trust made a number of new clinical appointments for the Causeway Hospital. The permanent appointments include consultants in surgery, gastroenterology, ga respiratory, <laughs> These are hard. Aesthetics, gynaecology, and a consultant physician, physician, in, a physician in internal medicine. And all I'm drinking is water. A joint post with Alton McGelvin Hospital uh, of a consultant cardiologist, and that is in the process of being recruited. Causeway Hospital, like several other smaller acute hospitals across Northern Ireland, has in the past experienced challenges in attracting permanent staff in some of its specialities. I am therefore pleased to see these new permanent clinical staff have arrived on site. The Trust is also recruiting three further posts, a consultant in emergency medicine, a consultant physician in general medicine and care of the elderly, and a consultant physician with an interest in respiratory medicine, and these processes remain open. These appointments are good news for the people of the people who, who use the Causeway Hospital, and it is expected that these permanent postings will enhance continuity and the quality of care of patients. Well, Mr Campbell for supplementary. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. <clears throat> and I too welcome the uh, intention to recruit the three new staff. Can the um, Minister uh, indicate, for example, the change that there has been uh, at the A&E compared to four years ago in terms of people waiting 12 hours or longer? I'm glad to say there has been a dramatic fall in the number of people waiting more than 12 hours at the Causeway Hospital. In 2011-12, there was 1,020. In 2012-13, there were 719. And in 2013-14, 156. And that is dramatic. That's almost a, an 80% fall. Well done to the staff, the clinicians, the consultants, and the nurses at the Causey Hospital who have delivered such a fundamental change in outcomes. That's, of course, uh, in the context of quite significant uh, increase in demand. Uh, and indeed, we over, almost 80% of patients in that hospital are seen within four hours. Uh, we, throughout Northern Ireland, demand on A&E and ED is increasing dramatically. Uh, we had over 2,200 more referrals uh, in December this year than the previous year. And that is putting significant pressure on our staff. And I'm glad to say that we were able, we, we were able uh, uh, to meet that demand, unlike 13 health trusts in England where emergency situations were declared, unlike the Republic of Ireland, where there were over 600 patients on trolley weights at one stage during December, January. So therefore, I think well, a lot has been achieved. And indeed, there have been no 12-hour breaches in the Causey Hospital since September 2013. So well done to all concerned. A huge effort by, by the Northern Trust team. I believe the, there's a brighter future for the Northern Trust. I think things are beginning to turn round in the Northern Trust. And congratulations to the Chief Executive and all those responsible. Call Mr. John Dollett. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I welcome the, the, the Minister's response and would, of course, say absolutely nothing negative about the Cosby Hospital. Would he agree with me that developing partnerships, not just with Antrim Hospital, which is in the same area trust, but also with Alton and Gelvin, which in turn has partnerships with Letterkenny Hospital, is in fact the key? And would he agree with me? that the Causeway Hospital in the future has a major role to play in the north and the northwest, and I do include Malinhead in that, because some patients actually come from there. I'm glad, I'm glad the members defend what he believes to be the north. That includes Malinhead. Um, yeah. what, what I can say, yes, and I, I think, I mean, well, first of all, joking aside, we have an excellent relationship with the, our colleagues in Letterkenny General. And the, for instance, when we had the fire in Alton Gavin a few years ago, they were immediately in there to try and help us out. 
uh, and I welcome that. And I, 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 that cooperation will continue. Yes, the Causeway Hospital is in a unique situation because it's equidistant from uh, Alton Gelvin and Londonderry and Antrim. And therefore, there is a crossover. And I've also already indicated there that the consultant cardiologists will be shared by both hospitals. Because folk who live in his constituency, if they live in Limavady, it's six or one half a dozen the other in terms of, of moving. And John Compton, in Transforming Your Care, outlined that hospitals should be not identified as silos or islands, but should be working in partnership with each other. And therefore, I, I welcome that. That not only helps in terms of patient care, but helps in, in maintaining the viability of individual hospitals. Uh, I think that's, that's very important, that the, the numbers are sufficient to maintain viability. So the, I think that the, the, the tide has turned for Causeway Hospital. I think things are now moving very much in the right direction. Yeah, yeah. And I believe that the new team in charge of the Northern Trust has given a new priority to that. And I know from letters that I've received from him that he certainly uh, believes that the Causeway Hospital is providing a first-rate standard of care. And we hope that's maintained in the future. Yeah. Call Mr Jim Allister. Thank you. Can I welcome the recent permanent appointments, not least because it's not so long ago that his predecessor was telling us about how difficult it was to recruit people permanently to the causeway. So I'm glad that that has been turned around. The minister says that he is committed to the retention of a small acute hospital at causeway. What does that mean, a small acute hospital, in terms of the level of clinical services and the range? including, for example, maternity? Can he spell out exactly the sort of services he's going to be doing? And does it in particular mean, will the present range of services all be retained? I think that the Honourable Member for North Antrim will need to just realise the current services that are being maintained in the causeway. There's a DD department, there's a day surgery, dermatology, children's ward, coronary care, cardiology, maternity, intensive care unit, x-ray department, uh, mortuary, gynaecology, minor injury unit, various theatres, older people's services, including a rehabilitation ward. The Causeway has a remarkable range of services already. Uh, and for, for, for a relatively small hospital, but when you compare it to Elton McGillan or the Royal or Antrim, the numbers going through Coleraine are much smaller. Uh, and I, but accepting that, I think that list indicates our commitment to the Causeway. could also say I think that the new management structure within the Northern Trust, and I'll be honest, the new Chief Executive, has instilled a confidence in the Northern Trust, and that the tide has turned in the sense that people have now confidence in the long-term future of the causeway and are prepared to apply. Now, he, he quite rightly said there was a, a difficulty obtaining consultant posts in the causeway. That was true. Adverts were not being answered. The number of applicants was very small. That has changed. We have made a series of major appointments, and we are continuing to do so, and I think that's good for the future. And I also say that the, the, the new chief executive of the Northern Trust has made a very strong personal commitment to the emergency department in the causeway. And I think that has to be good for the future of that relatively modern hospital. Well, Mr. Robin Swan. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. The Minister referred to hospitals working in partnership. He will know that the Dalriada Hospital is used as a step down facility for the Causeway Hospital. Can he give the House an update on where the Dalriada Hospital stands at the minute? The Honourable Member will know that a judicial review was taken by one of the patients who used the Dalriada, and interim relief was granted by the courts in response to that. So therefore, I am abiding by the terms of that legal opinion, uh, and therefore uh, there, there, there is no change as, at the moment in services at the Dalriada. I could also say that there has been the most incredible public response in the Moy area to uh, the, any change in the status of the Dalriada. And indeed, I think we've all been taken aback by the sheer scale of that uh, and the input from the entire community. So therefore, we keep the situation under review. But as far as I say, that the, the, the Trust has confirmed that it will fully comply with the Court's interim relief ruling and has restored the, the status quo Dalriado by increasing the staffing complement and admitting additional patients. So I think that's an indication that this department, when the Court's rule, we simply have to follow that. We have no other option. Order. That ends the period for listed questions. We now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. I call Mr Sean Rogers. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister for an update in terms of what he's trying to do to reduce the health inequalities currently being experienced by cancer patients here as opposed to in England? <laughs> I thought he was going to ask a question about Down Hospital, but he isn't. The, the situation is that, as he knows, we've had the, the review of the IFR 
the, the individual uh, funding request. That's out for consultation, and that is indicating that we're going to do away with the 95% the exceptionality criteria. Uh, indicative of what I said when I launched uh, that particular uh, review and its uh, findings was that we will be trebling the amount of money setting has been set aside for cancer drugs, uh, uh, that's non-nice approved cancer drugs in Northern Ireland. If he reads the figures, it's quite clear the quantum of what we're trying to do. There will be two committees set up to, to look at requests for funding of non-nice approved drugs, and we would expect that these new committees will be much more flexible in their approach, and that uh, the people of Northern Ireland won't have to jump through hoops as they were doing under the old criteria. These drugs, of course, most of them are life-extending and life-enhancing rather than life-preserving. But still, my view is that we should try and make certain that someone in Downpatrick is in the same position as someone in Durham or Dundee when it comes to these particular products. There will still be people who will be turned down under a much lower exceptionality threshold. As far as the more general issue is concerned, Northern Ireland, through the Belfast Cancer Centre, based at the Belfast City Hospital, has been able to produce outstanding um, significant progress in survival rates. And indeed, for some of them, like uh, testicular cancer and prostate cancer and breast cancer, we're now into the 80 per cent, which is remarkable. So therefore, we can hold our head up uh, and say that we are making progress. But still, there are other cancers, such as ovarian, such as uh, pancreatic and lung, where the survival rates are extremely poor. And we need to continue to work on those because, for instance, in lung, less than 10 per cent of the people are, li are alive after 10 years. And for, uh, for pancreatic, it's less than 5 per cent. And those are the really worrying conditions that we need to bear down on. But I think Northern Ireland is doing well in this field. And that's thanks to people like Paddy Johnston and his team of oncologists at Belfast City Hospital. I remind the Minister about the standing work. Road. Could I thank the Minister for his answer and welcome his answer and also on a personal level um, commend the work of the Cancer Centre in, in Belfast City Hospital. But considering, Minister, that the revelation that 36 million had been received by the Department from the PPRS rebate scheme, um, what's your assessment of the benefits of creating a cancer drug fund immediately rather than without prescription charges? Um, I think, I'm glad he's asked this question because I think we do look, need to look in depth what he means by the PPRS. This year, in 1415, we're going to get about £13 million in P PPRS refunds. Next year, we think it's going to be £30 million for 1516. Well, I'd say the Honourable Member for South Belfast doesn't agree with me, but whether it's £13 million or £14 million, it's neither here nor there, because, because, because we are spending an extra £12 million this year in nice approved drugs and therefore whatever we get back from PPRS is completely gobbled up. We can carry that 12 million into next year and we'll be spending another maybe 13 or 14 million pounds on nice approved drugs. So, so therefore that will eat up entirely the PPR, PPRS uh, rebate. Now I want to have a, and of course PPRS is a five year program, it may not be here uh, in five years time. I try to develop a sustainable model that will ensure that we have the money not just for cancer drugs but all specialist drugs and treatments for the foreseeable future. And that's why I suggested a very small prescription charge of maybe 30 pence, 50 pence or a pound with a, 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 an exemption certificate of 20 or 25 pounds. Now, the latest model I've seen has suggested that will raise an additional 16 million pounds. Now, is anyone telling me that is not fair, that someone who's maybe getting thousands of pounds worth of free prescription drugs cannot pay a pound per item or 50 pence per item? That's what's out to debate, and I'd be very interested to see what people's views are on it. But that, to me, is a sustainable model for the future, long after PPRS is gone. Call Mr. John Dallet. Uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, perhaps following on from the very same subject, the Minister will be aware that the Public Accounts Committee published a report in the last couple of weeks uh, indicating that in 2012 and 2013, £14 million could have been saved if GPs had prescribed cheaper generic drugs, and in the next three years, the amount saved could be £54 million. What does the Minister say about that? First of all, our generic rate at the moment is 72%, and because of our concern about the alleged wastage, we have imposed a £20 million saving on pharmacy for next year to try and ensure that clinicians and pharmacists and hospitals 
uh, grind down on any perceived wastage. I uh, just could I say that, uh, that over the last 10 years, the use of generic drugs has gone from uh, 41 per cent to 71 per cent, and now 72 per cent. And in the four-year period from 2013-14, the Department, through the HSC, delivered £132 million of efficiencies in prescribing uh, efficiencies. And that, I think, gives an indication of just how important we, are dealing, how we consider this issue to be. Uh, we are up there with, with many other nations in terms of our generic uh, cost base, and I think we're, we're doing very well in that sense. But there are clearly wastages in the system, and I think we need to, tr to drive that down. The problem is, of course, whilst we're doing that, demand continues to rise, and there's been a very significant rise since we went to totally free prescriptions. And I think we need to give prescriptions a value. It's a bit like a free newspaper. A free newspaper comes through my door. It's hardly read because it's of no value. But if I buy a copy of the Moan Observer, the Down Recorder, I read it because I've invested some of my hard-earned cash in buying it. So therefore, I think equally the same principle, a very small, a very small charge will encourage people to think, A, do I need that prescription? And B, now that I've paid a pound or whatever for it, I should well use it and use it properly. So this is out to consultation. I want to see the, the views of the industry, individual pharmacists and the public on this very important issue. But I think if we get it right, we can have a long-term funding stream, which will mean that many of the arguments about various drugs and vaccinations, etc., will no longer apply because we'll have the money to pay for it. Mr. Dalek, first supplement. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, there's an awful lot in the, the Minister's answer, but none of it about those GPs who are not prescribing the cheaper generic uh, prescriptions that could be equally as good. Would the Minister agree with me that having uh, talked to Sean Lo Rogers earlier, wouldn't this savings be wonderful to invest in a cancer fund? Yeah, and we, we, we're continuing to look at that uh, particular issue. But remember, it's a decision for the indig individual GP what he or she prescribes. And GPs tell me that there is a certain resistance amongst their patients when a different box appears, even though Clinically, it's exactly the same product. There's a resistance, if it hasn't, isn't sort of the yellow and orange or whatever, that they've always had. You move them on to the generic, which can be 90% cheaper, they say it doesn't have the same impact, and therefore there's pressure on the doctor to prescribe the branded product. Now, we need to continue to do this, but I can, can assure you that the overall trend is very much in the direction of further generics. There's no, there's no question about it. We are getting there. Uh, and we need to take the BMA and the doctors with us on this particular issue. But I'm hoping that the £20 million efficiency saving, which I'm imposing next year, will force everyone to have another look at this issue. I would say, mind you, on the report, we have to be a bit careful because it's still going through the process of the Public Accounts Committee. And we have a view on some of the assertions made in it. It's not all as black and white as it seems. And the, the experts within the department tell me it, it's just not entirely correct in its assumptions. But the basic idea, do we need to have drive in, down more efficiencies in our prescribing budget? Yes, we do. But all of that will simply be gobbled up with other demands within the health service. It is not going to produce the, the, the crock of gold at the end of the rainbow, which can be used forever and a day to introduce new non nice approved drugs in Northern Ireland. We need something much more sustainable. Call Mr Jimmy Spratt. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, can I ask the Minister, in relation to, I understand, officials told the Health Committee last week that uh, there was still a gap of some £30 million to fill in next year's budget, and that's uh, to avoid uh, unpalatable decisions for the Executive. Uh, in light of that, uh, and absolutely no money uh, being available uh, to keep up also with developments that are going to be introduced across the water, can I ask the Minister what uh, and how no money for those developments uh, would be felt by patients and indeed uh, by members of the general public? I alluded to this earlier. Um, we are in an extremely difficult position because even looking at all the difficult efficiency savings we have to make, we are something between £29 and £30 million pounds short for 1516. On top of that, we've identified about £100 million pounds of new service developments which ideally we'd like to deliver in things like elective care, nursing levels, public health initiatives including vaccinations, nice drugs and special service, mental health and learning disability and TYC transitional funding. And as things stand at the moment, we have no money for those at all. And I'll just give you one example. 
The previous minister quite rightly pledged that once it, Buxero was introduced in GB and approved, and the agreement reached between the drugs company and the department over there, we would introduce that for meningitis B sufferers in Northern Ireland uh, as a vaccination to prevent anyone contracting meningitis B. Now, that is a very, very worthy initiative. But at the minute, we're getting figures quoted uh, of it costing maybe £1.5 to £2 million pounds to do it for all under, under once. Now, I want to do that. But when I literally have no money in the budget, even to balance the books with what we've already committed to, it's going to be very difficult to see where we can get the cash to introduce that. And that's why the new medicines fund, I think, is a very good idea, because something like the Casero could be brought in and used, uh, implemented using that money. And I want to be in a position where meningitis, we've got rid of A and C. I'm hoping that soon we'll get rid of B, meningitis B. We're going to tackle W. And the question is, is it a worthy objective to make certain that parents no longer have this anguish when their child gets something like flu-like symptoms that it could be meningitis? But I have to find the money, and I need the support of this House before I can do that. Mr. Pratt, first supplement. I thank the Minister for his answer. And in light of your answer, Minister, uh, and in the situation that you find yourself within the health department. How then do you view calls uh, recently that £300 million uh, more money should be directed towards enhanced uh, welfare payments? Obviously, some of it would be taken away from your department. Yes, uh, when I heard that, I automatically did the sums, and the 40 per cent, that means £120 million would be taken out of my budget for 15-16 to fund welfare uh, claimants. Now, £120 million on the basis that I can't even find the £29 million to bridge the funding gap for next year, and I can't find the £100 million in order to introduce new services would be absolutely disastrous. And members of this House need to know the consequences of that because £120 million were into such serious cutbacks in health that you could not guarantee public safety, because that comes on top of £163 million of savings uh, that have been obtained, £170 million of savings this year and £163 million of savings next year, and another £50 million that has to come out of arm length bodies like the fire service, the PHA, the BSO. That is how difficult the situation is. So I am watching with trepidation. Uh, if, if that happens, it will certainly lead to a deterioration in services and waiting times. The quality of services provided to patients would be compromised, and it would be, we'd have an inability to respond to the growing needs of the population of, of Northern Ireland, and we'd compromise the delivery of key ministerial priorities and commitments. It is as black as that, and certainly as one who has seen the figures, I would urge the Assembly to step back from anything which would lead to the reduction of my budget for 1516. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister when will his department uh, publish guidelines on termination of pregnancy? Well, as the member knows, this is a very emotive and very difficult issue. Uh, and there have been various attempts to introduce guidelines in Northern Ireland. The last set of guidelines were challenged by one of the pro-life charities successfully. Uh, there have been various attempts to produce a, government, uh, a document which the executive can agree. We are still in that process. Um, I, I would have to admit to her that it is perhaps one of the most difficult issues uh, facing me and the department at the moment. I have no doubt whatever document is produced will be judicially reviewed. If it's seen as being too liberal, it will be judicially reviewed by the pro-life groups. And if it's uh, judged to be too strong on the pro-life stance, it will be judicially reviewed by one of the, uh, what's called, euphemistically called, the pro-life charities. So it's one of those areas where I think it's almost insoluble. It's extremely difficult. I'm working on it at the minute. Uh, we're hoping to have something before the executive within the next few weeks. Order. Time is up.